Hi everyone! Today I'm especially delighted as I will be doing my very first Kickstarter preview of this prototype of Höyük by the Mage Company. I have to point out that this is not a paid Kickstarter preview, so I'm really just doing this out of fun and out of interest and I'm really glad that I could take the chance to preview this prototype of this game here. As this is a prototype version of the game, it has to be clear that the components you see here are definitely not final. So they are just printed off on, on thick cardboard here. So overall the artwork looks good already and this was never a problem with mage games to be honest. So really their artwork is normally really pretty good. But of course you might really see some different artwork in the final product as well as maybe some changes and of course the quality will increase even more. Hayuk is not really a new game. I believe this has been self-published as a print-to-play version um, already quite some years ago by the designer Pierre Canuel. I believe also that the rules were a little bit different or I think they extended this game a little bit with this version what you see here. So for, for instance the original game I think only supported 2-4 to four player whereas this version will support 2-5 to five players. I believe there were only 5 card bases for the aspects card in the original game. This game will come with 7 of these card bases so in order to get you score different aspects of the game. As I haven't played the original game, I will focus of course on this version here that has just launched on Kickstarter. So if you like this game, then please feel free to reach out to the Kickstarter page. I will definitely put a link in the description field of this video and then you are free to back it. The game comes in a basic variant, a medium variant and an advanced variant where you will be using all the 70 aspect cards that will come with the game. In this video I will focus on the base mode of this game because it's really enough to give you a good overview about the core mechanics of how you can all the components are going together. In Hoyuk each player is representing a clan in the Neolithic area so around 9 to 10,000 years ago in the Anatolia region somewhere in the Middle East. And the goal of this game is to earn as many victory points as possible and you do this by once extending your families and extending the blocks and villages in this game and you score points mostly by playing out these aspect cards which grant you some victory points and you can play these cards basically more or less all through the game but I will explain that to you and the idea is to collect as many sets as possible as a set will grant you more points than just single cards but again I will show you that in a second. Once a player places his 25th house on the game board this will trigger the end of the game. Of course we will always finish this actual game round so all the players can still play aspects card and stuff but this will really be the trigger for the end of this round you play all the phases here and then after this round the game ends. Of course this also includes the player who places the 25th house. There's always a possibility to shorten the game and I think this is already encouraged when you play with full five players because the game board can get pretty crowded so the designers at this point in time more or less recommend that in a five player game you reduce this to 20 houses for example. In the basic game you only play with these 10 construction tiles here whereas in the more advanced game you also have these construction tiles that takes care of the cattle, the families or I think there should also be the shaman. And then there are the catastrophe cards. In the base game you play with 10 of these catastrophe cards so for example here we have the tornado or the fire here and normally in each round you will have one catastrophe but you will skip that phase in the very first round of the game. Next we have the so-called aspect cards and the aspect cards also come in different flavors. For once there is a little bit of a thematic graphic object this really hasn't any effect to the game it's just making the card look nice but what is important is the icon on the top left corner of this card in this case this would be a shrine and then on the lower left side you see some set bonus that you get when you play these cards as victory points so there are for example as you see the shrines there are the ovens houses and there are also cards that show a wild card symbol. You can acquire these aspect cards in phase 
three of each game round where you more or less evaluate all the blocks in the game who has the majority of ovens, shrines or pens here. As I mentioned in the more advanced or medium game you would also score the majority of the houses or who has the biggest houses in a block. Some additional tiles are the oven, the shrine and the pens and these are more or less being used to uh, calculate the majority of a given block in order to provide you the appropriate aspect cards. I think I will explain you the game by playing one or two rounds. Of course I will also show you what happens by the end of the game. But let's get just started. Each game round consists normally of four phases. The first phase would be the construction phase where you uh, would deal each player two of these construction cards here. Then you place your houses, your pans, your ovens, your shrine accordingly. The next phase would be the catastrophe phase. As I mentioned the catastrophe phase is not taking place during the very first round. The third phase would then be the aspect card phase. In this case you would score the actual blocks or basically check for the majority of each of the aspects in each of the blocks that are on the game board here. And phase four is just the end of round where you do some cleanup and you would assign a new starting player. Let's start with a construction phase here. For each player in the game the starting player draws one construction tile from the pile. So let's just assume we would have a three player game here. So he would deal the first construction tile to himself, then the second construction tile to the second player. Of course that's all in clockwise direction and then we would have the third construction tile going to the third player. At the start of the game the game board is of course empty so there are no houses whatsoever and you can build your houses basically on every of these um, little squares here. Not sure if you see them pretty good but they are definitely there so they help you to align the houses accordingly and you can really place these houses wherever you want to have them so you can directly put it here on a palm, on a hill or on a river. This is really only graphical elements and really don't have any relation to the actual gameplay. So let's have a look at the construction tile that the first player has drawn here and let's just consider the first player would be the guy with the purple houses so he would now be allowed to place two of these houses or he has to play two houses here so he would place one house for example. Here you can really the very first house you can place wherever you want to have that. And then the next house is already a tactical decision you have to make. You can either extend any existing block and a family within that block. So for example you could just play the second house to this block here. So this block will now be extended and you will also extend your family in that block. But you could also start a new block somewhere else. In this case you have two blocks and you're also having two families. And this is really important as you are only allowed to play as many aspect cards in any given game round as you have families on the game board. So in this case purple would have two families so we would be allowed to play two aspect cards in a game round. Let's consider we keep it that as it is and now we would go to the next player who would be the blue player. Blue has drawn this construction tile here so this lets him also build two houses and then he could decide whether to place a shrine or an oven tile. So I think he could also now go for the same block here or he could also start a new block here but I think he really wants to score some points later on and as I mentioned you only score points in a block or aspect cards if you really have neighbors in that same block. So if you are alone in your block you never gain any majorities or aspect cards from this block. So I think Blue will now place his first house here and maybe his second house more or less close to this block and then as his third action he could then whether to go for this shrine or for the oven. I think I will go for the shrine because the third player, let me show that to you, the yellow player has an oven here so in there could already be competing around majorities of ovens in this block. So I think he will make it easy and I think he will go for a shrine on a house and 
you have to decide for each house if you want to place a shrine on top of it or if you want to put an oven of it. So on a house there can be either a shrine or an oven, but a house could definitely have attached a pen to it and as well a shrine or an oven. Yellow also wants a piece of the cake here, so he wants to make sure that he puts at least one house here in this block, so he would put his first yellow house close to this block. And I think we will start a new block by placing a house somewhere far off the original block or the first block here that the purple player started. But with his third construction action he will put the oven on his yellow house here. So in this case all the players would theoretically have the majority in one of the aspects. Blue would go for the shrines, purple would go for the pens and yellow would go for the ovens. But as I mentioned to you there will be a second construction card being dealt to all of the players so the majority can definitely change in the next construction phase. Let's see, this is the construction tile for the purple player. Here we have blue and then we have the yellow player. Purple will place his first house in this first block. And you can now either place a house beside your family here. So in this case you could place it here, here or here. You cannot start a new family in the same block. So you cannot just say, oh, I want to start a new family in this block by placing it down here. That's definitely not possible. If you place a house into an existing block and you already have a family here, you will always have to play it adjacent to your family to extend your family. But you could also say, no, I want to go big. I want a big house in my village or in my family. And this is the tiebreaker when inspecting the majorities of any block here. For example, when there is a tie for these shrines here, then the player who has the tie on a house that has two levels, for example, then this player would win this inspection. And I think this is what Purple will do in order to secure his majority of pens. So he will increase the height of this house here. And it has to be mentioned that you can never increase your, the size of your house twice. So you're not allowed to put in a third layer on top of your already big house like this. The second house Purple will place into this block that the yellow player has started. So he has now two families on the board, which is good in order to play as many aspect cards as possible. And for his third construction action, he will go for this pen and we'll also put that in the new block here in order to gain an additional majority, maybe. Let's see what Blue will do. Blue has two houses and then either an oven or a pen. I think he will place his two houses also to this new block here on the right. And I think he will directly build a big house. So he'll place one house here, one house here. And for his third construction action, he will place a pen. Yeah, it really doesn't matter at this point in time, a pen close to this house here. So this was already the construction card of the blue player. And then we come to the very last construction action in this round and this would be for the yellow player. He would place his first house beside this house. He would also build one high house in this block here. And on this high house he would also place his oven. This was the end of phase one. Normally we would come to phase two now where we would play a catastrophe card, but as mentioned, we don't do that during the very first round. So we can directly jump over to the third phase and this would be the aspect cards. Let's do some scoring. The first block that is being scored is always selected by the starting player and purple would say, okay, I want to score this block here first. And then you start scoring all the different aspects in each of these blocks. You start with the ovens, then the shrines, and last you would score the pens in each of the blocks. Let's have a look at this very first block. In this very first block only the yellow player has an oven on his house. So the yellow player would now be allowed to draw the aspect cards that is located on the aspect card base that shows the oven here. So yellow would take this card here. But let's go back to this block here. The next thing that we would score would be the shrines and in this block only the blue player has a shrine here. So blue would now be allowed 
to draw the top card from this aspect card base here. And last but not least, for this block you would score the pens, and in this block only the purple player has a pen, and again, purple would now be allowed to draw the top card from this deck here. Whenever a deck is depleted, you cannot gain any cards by scoring the majority in any given block. So this is already very important to keep in mind so that you don't focus only on pans throughout the game because sooner or later this deck will be depleted then and each of this deck starts with only 10 cards in it. Okay, we have scored this very first block. Now the second player could decide which block to score next. In this case, we only have one more block. And so we would start again with the oven C in this case. Only the yellow player has an oven in this block here. So the yellow player could again draw the top card from this aspect card base. We don't have any shrines in this block, so we don't score them. And the next thing we would score would be the pens. And this is already a very interesting situation now. Both the blue and the purple player has one pen in this block here. But as blue has the most high houses in this block, just one, but that's enough to serve as a tiebreaker, blue would now be allowed to draw the top card from this deck here. As we have scored all the blocks that are currently on the game board, we would go to phase number four and this would be end of round. But I have to explain you one additional thing now. And this is in respect how to play these aspect cards. You can spend these aspect cards at the start of each of the phase of a given round. Really you have to do that at the very start of each of these phases. So theoretically you could play four times in a game round aspect cards. But there's also another restriction and this is in respect to how many cards you are allowed to play during a game round and this is corresponding to the amount of families. So both or all of the players have two families in the village so all of the players could play theoretically two aspect cards in any given game round. And you can spend these aspect cards in two different ways. For once you can use the advantage that's printed on the top left corner of this card, meaning in this case you can build a shrine on one of your houses. Nice. But the nicer thing is on the bottom left of this side, this, you can use this card to score actual points. And this is now where the set idea comes into play. If you would only play one card that shows this shrine icon, then you would only gain one victory point. But if you would play two of the cards that shows the shrine symbol, in this case you would already gain three victory points for playing these cards. And this goes up up to five cards with the same icon, then you would score 12 victory points. Isn't that nice? If you would play it that way, then you would score three points for this card or for this set basically, and one additional point for this card because it shows a different icon. You would always start with a starting player and I think let's do that. I think really purple wants to build a shrine. So he will spend this aspect card here to play the shrine on this high house here. And this is already important. Both players now blue and purple have a shrine in this block here. But as purple built his shrine on his high house here, theoretically he would score the majority during the next, next aspect card phase. Blue will also go for the shrine here, so we will spend only this aspect card here. And he will place this shrine on this high house in the other block here. So this would more or less give him already a great advantage over any other player who would maybe place a shrine on this block here. At the end of the round, you would always put back all the used aspect cards and you put them back on the aspect card basis. You put them under a stack of your choice but you have to put all the cards you have spent under one single stack so you cannot divide cards to different aspect card bases so for example if the player would have played these three cards then he has to put these three cards under one single aspect card space the very last thing that happens in phase four is that the current starting player can choose a new starting player. Yes, you heard that right. He will choose the new starting player, but he cannot remain the starting player. So in this case, to keep it easy, he will just give the starting player token to the blue player. A new game round would begin. So we would start with the construction phase again. This time it, we would start with a blue player. So this would be the tile, the first tile for the blue player. Here we would have yellow and here we would have 
purple. Let's see what they can do with that. His first house he will place somewhere below here, so he's now eager to start a new block. And I believe he will put his second house in this second block here, so he tries to really expand his influence in this block here as well. For his third action, I believe he will place the shrine in this area here. So right now he would again have the majority of shrines in this block. I think yellow will join the blue player down there. So he will build one house here and I think he will place immediately a high house in this block here. And then with a third action, he would directly play a shrine on this high house here. So right now in this block, yellow would have the majority in respect to shrines. I think blue wants to join here as well. And I think he will place his first house here. And I think he will have to place his second house there. But for his third action, he can choose any of those four here. So I think purple will increase his house in this block here as well. Right now he would not score any majorities, but remember there will definitely be a second construction step in this phase. And then we come to the second step of this construction phase. There's only one construction tile left. So this tile will definitely go to the starting player being the blue player. And now we will shuffle the remaining construction tiles, so all the construction tiles that have been played. And then we can start giving out the remaining tiles to the remaining players. So again, this would be for blue, this would be for yellow, and he would have the tile for the purple player. Not really great for the purple player, but yeah, I think he can definitely live with that. Okay, I think blue one don't want to give any aspect card to the yellow player here at this point in time. So I think he will place one house here. He will build also a high house. And with his third action, he has to place a shrine. He will place a shrine on his high house here. So there's no majority in respect to shrines in this block. Yellow is really into oven, it seems. So I think he will expand his family in this block here. And then he will also build a high house in this block here. And on top of this high house, he will definitely build another oven. So right now he would have at least one additional majority in respect to these ovens in this block here as well. Purple is starting a new block up there close to the river very nice spot high rents and such and for his second house i think he will have to extend the family here and he will put the pen that he is allowed to build next to his high house in this block here as well these are all the construction actions and as of this round we definitely have to deal with a catastrophe. So let's draw ourselves our first catastrophe card. And here we have a bad season. And the bad season comes in two flavors. One with the least shrines and one with the most shrines. The other card shows two of these shrine icons. So in this case, in the block with the least built shrines, all residents must dismantle, destroy one of their houses. So let's go over to the game board. And as you can see, it's now really a pity for the purple player. So I think it was not really a good idea to place this house at this point in time, because this is definitely the block with the least built shrines. All the other blocks have at least one shrine in it. So only this block is affected. So this house will be destroyed and theoretically be removed from the game. You can still place another house on top of this house, but then this house will definitely be removed from the game. So purple can definitely not use it anymore. As we have dealt with the catastrophe, you would now come to the aspect card phase. And I really want to point out that you can play these aspect cards at the start of each of the phases. Yellow could now break the majority of shrines in this block here. And I think he will do that. So he will definitely go and play this aspect card here. So this would allow him to play one or place one shrine on any of his buildings. So he will go definitely for this tile here. 
And then we come to the actual scoring and blue will start, I think, yeah, maybe with this block here. And we would start again with the ovens in this case. Yellow would take the oven card from this uh, for his majority of ovens in this block. There is no more majority in respect to shrines here, so this will be skipped, but then we score the pens. And in this case, he has the majority because he built the pen next to a high house, so he would be allowed to take the aspect card for the pens. Next, yellow would choose a block to score and he will just go to this block down here. Again, we will start with the ovens and again, yellow will be the player to score the ovens in this block. Again, we have no majority in respect to shrines. Both of these shrines are built on high houses. Again, there is no majority, so we can jump over to the pens. In this case, purple has the most pens in this block, so he would be allowed to draw this tile here. And then we can score the last block here. We would start with the ovens again. Again, yellow would have the most ovens. The shrine cup definitely goes to the blue player here. And again, the pens will be scored by the purple player. So we've inspected all of our blocks here. So we come to round number four. And again, the players would be allowed to play any aspect cards here. So let's see what we have. Yellow could be the starting player in the next round. So I think he's really tempted to play this aspect card here. This aspect card would let him immediately build a pen and he would build the pen close to his high house in this block down there. I think purple will play this aspect card here to build an oven and he really wants to break the majority of ovens in this block here so he'll place the oven on this house. And I think that's it in respect to these aspect cards. So we will do the cleanup. This means we would put all the played aspect cards um, to any aspect card base. And again, the last thing to do is to assign a new starting player. And again, we will keep it simple. We will give this starting player token to the yellow player. And this would move on until one of the players has played his 25th house on the game board. We would finish this round. And then at the end of the round, there will be some kind of an end game scoring for once. Every player scores one victory point for each aspect card still on his hand, but note, you don't gain any bonuses for sets at this point in time anymore. So if you really want to collect the set bonus, you have to do that during the game and not at the end of the game. And the last thing to score is the size of a family in any given block. And you would just count the houses in that block. As a tiebreaker again, we have the high houses. And if there's also a tie, then no actual point is rewarded. And then the player with the mo uh, biggest family in one block gains one victory point for each house in a block. So for example, in this case, purple has two houses, blue has two houses, purple has the highest house in this block here, so he would score two additional victory points. In this block, all the players have two houses and all of the players have two high houses, so there will be no points rewarded in this block. Of course, whoever has the most victory points wins this game. And this ends my preview of Hoyuk. I really have to say that Hoek is a very deep strategic game. You really have to think a lot how to um, optimize your villages. Do you want to enlarge your family? Do you want to start a new block? Where do you want to put your shrines, ovens and pens? You have to foresee what aspect cards are available during the next uh, aspect card phase and so on. So you really have to think about a lot. Remember, I only show to you the basic game and really in the medium game, you would also score the most houses in each block or the highest houses in each block. In the really advanced games, you only have to deal with families and cattle. You have the shaman who is taking care of catastrophes and so. So really, this game brings you a lot of replayability and a lot of depth to you. So I really enjoyed playing this game. So if you really like this game, I recommend reach out to the Kickstarter page and back it to get grab yourself a copy. I think it's definitely worth it. It's a relatively balanced game and that's because the game is not new. So it's been on the market for quite some time. Of course, they did some rework uh, here and there. So they extended the original concept a little bit. But overall, the game is really pretty balanced and I think it's really mature and this could really be a great fit for your gaming group. 
I hope you enjoyed my very first preview of a prototype here and I hope to see you soon in one of my next videos, playthroughs or reviews and until then, bye bye.